So we're not still very sure, and it's really hard to do research on this topic because you, because you can't have a bunch of healthy volunteers and say, we want to expose you to a bunch of radiation and see if that's going to cause cancer in 30 years. There are problems with that. Obviously, that's a huge ethical dilemma. You can't expose healthy people to, to something that can be harmful. And B, the technology that we have now might be radically different in 30 years, so that data could be basically worthless. And like, for instance, the amount of radiation that kids got 30 years ago when they got a CT scan is way more than they get now. So data is really a shifting, a shifting target. So if truly there is a slightly increased risk for getting, um, uh, or a slightly increased risk of getting cancer from having a CT scan or two when you're young, it is literally a drop in the bucket in terms of your risk of getting cancer already, just as a human in modern society, is, as I said, already very high. So to add one more drop in an already full bucket, you have to put that into context of what the benefit of having a CT scan is. Assuming you all have, if you do have kids, they're healthy, they're outside. Let's say they're in the park and they're mountain biking and they fall off their bike, they hit their head, they lose consciousness, they wake up, they've got some neck pain, they go to the ER. Well, the ER doctor has to scan the kid's head and the neck to make sure that they don't have a bleed intracranially or that they don't have a cervical spine fracture. All right? And if a, the doctor didn't do that, that would be total malpractice. So the questions that are getting answered by this CT scan are incredibly important. Life can, can alter a child or a patient's life immediately or down the road. So the risk and benefit are, are, are very, very unbalanced. In most, in almost all cases, when we do a CT scan, the benefit really outweighs whatever potential very small risk it is. All right, um, and I'm just talking. Thanks for coming. You're like everyone else here is. They know me, so I'm not being really <laughs> informal. So, uh, um, so I'm more, a little more informal than I probably would have been. But uh, so, what is a pediatric radiologist? So we're in an imager. We're a physician who has been subspecialized trained uh, to deal with. Uh, um, specific uh, health problems and imaging needs of kids. So we're physicians, we go through medical school, and then we do a year of internship where we care for patients directly, and then we do a residency, which is four years um, in, in radiology, and that's general radiology, adult radiology, pediatric radiology. And then if you do a fellowship in some field within, some subfield within radiology, you do another year, my, my fellowship was in pediatric radiology. Um, and in that year, all I did was just, I just did imaging for kids. Uh, the pediatric radiologists don't really specialize in the organ system, we kind of specialize in the age range, all right? And so we have to deal with uh, little ones who are born at 23 weeks, gestational age, like four months early, or uh, this 17-year-old kid who wants to tackle you really, really hard. <laughs> all right, and obviously they're doing different things and they have different disease processes. And uh, to put it into context, this is a, an x-ray of the newborn's hand, all right? And then this is an x-ray of like, an adult, the mature hand, all right? And so we have to, as a pediatric radiologist, I have to know all about the development of, uh, you know, organ systems and what looks normal and what doesn't look normal in kids versus adults and whatnot. Um, and before I get into radiation, I just thought I'd talk, give a few examples of some things that we do in pediatric radiology. So one of the major, um, one of the major uh, um, aspects of pediatric radiology is dealing with kids who are newborns, who are born prematurely, particularly because those kids have a lot of complex health needs. Uh, and this is a newbie, this is a, a premature baby who, uh, uh, is, they're all sick if they're born prematurely enough, they just need a lot of uh, additional help. So this kid has a breathing tube down his, down his throat, and then this is actually a catheter that's put in the belly button, in the, in the umbilical, the remnant of the umbilical cord, and that goes back up to the heart. You know, you have a belly button for the vessels that supply nutrients and oxygen. Um, and I always thought that's kind of cool that we do that. And to put it in context, that right there is the finger of a nurse or somebody holding the kid's hand out of the way so we can take a picture. Same thing right here. You can see that fingertip is bigger than you know this kid's leg. All right, so they are really small. Uh, and this is just a list that I came up of things, uh, uh, various pathologies that kids, these, these kids deal with both either acutely or chronically. Uh, I just came up with this list in you know, 10 seconds or something. All the different things that they have to, they kind of have to, they get thrown into the world and have to deal with. Um, 
Here's some examples of various pediatric tumors. One of the big things we did uh, in fellowship is you know, big cancer centers, so we dealt with pediatric cancer. It's not super common in kids, but it definitely happens. Uh, this is a, so these two are CT scans of the belly in two different patients. Um, this is a bit of the liver here. This is a kidney that's part of the spine. And then this big kind of gnarly mass right here is a, is a tumor called neuro, neuroblastoma. That's a tumor that's specific for fairly young kids. Uh, this is also a tumor that's specific for fairly young kids too. It's a tumor growing out of this kidney here and it's called a Wilms tumor. Adults don't get this only fairly little kids do. This is an MRI of a, of a little one um, and where it's kind of looking straight on the kid here. And uh, this is a, a normal uh, a femur, okay, so a normal leg bone. And then this kid also has a, a, a neuroblastoma that's gone to, to his femur. And they can do that. Uh, and so we're, as pediatric imagers, supposed to be specialized in how we acquire these images and then interpret them. Uh, I, I love this picture. Uh, this is a, two MRI images of a face, of faces. All right, these are two different individuals. This is an adult face, and then this is a, a newborn's face. Uh, the black here is air in the sinuses. Well, we love sinuses. And then you can see the, the eyes and the lenses of the eyes and these dark things right here. That's the nose, that's the hard palate, the roof of the mouth. You can actually see the, the patient's tongue here, those are the teeth. And then this is a baby here. Babies don't have sinuses. And they don't have mustaches either. Those are the uninterrupted uh, baby teeth. All right. that's, that's, it's both kind of disturbing yet cute at the same time. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so that. Um, this is one major aspect of being a pediatric radiologist. And uh, fortunately, not that I, would, I haven't had to deal with any of this here. Uh, but we dealt with this uh, multiple times a week during my fellowship. Uh, and this is a, a child who, this is a chest x-ray, and then it's kind of hard to see, but an x-ray of the, the wrist, basically the end of the, the arm here. And this child has some characteristic fractures that are uh, highly concerning for child abuse, non accidental trauma, okay? And uh, for instance, every pediatric chest x-ray I look at, I'm looking for, do I see a root fracture, posterior root fracture, because that's uh, something that's kind of specific for uh, uh, child abuse. Obviously, I'm not thinking that I'm expecting to see it, but that's one of my parts of my training. I have to look for that. Um, and we do, as pediatric radiologists, often get, uh, we, we can be called into court to, to testify for these things. Um, sometimes kids just, like, just swallow kids. <laughs> uh, uh, one last, uh, one or two more uh, examples is kind of, uh, this is a surgical emergency in a little one in a newborn. A uh, newborn shows up who's kind of thrown up this really, really apple green stuff. Um, and we're concerned about something really catastrophically wrong with the kid's, uh, with the kid's gut and small bowel. And in this case, what we've done is we've um, had the kid, we've injected some contrast into the esophagus, and we're had the kid drink some contrast, and this is contrast in the stomach here. And then you can see it's leaving the stomach and coming out in the small bowel, and it's all corkscrewed around. You get a better sense of it on this lateral. And you see the bowel's all corkscrewed. It's all twisted on itself. And that's a serious a medical emergency, a surgical emergency, because the bowel gets twisted on itself, it's gonna die eventually, and actually pretty quickly. So the surgeon has to go in and unwrap that and, and place it in an appropriate spot. Um, and uh, usually when we're doing these exams, it's in the middle of the night, and uh, the surgeon, the pediatric surgeon's usually right there in the room with us, because once we, once we have this image, it goes right to surgery. Um, this is a, uh, just some of the examples of uh, trauma, okay? And, uh, and so I know I'm talking about radiation today. For trauma, you use CT, that's what you use. That's, that's what you use. Um, it's quick, it's non-invasive, it gives really definitive answers. So these are all pediatric, these are all kids, kids' examples of trauma. So this is a belly right here, you can then see the liver, these are the kidneys, that's the spine. So this child has a laceration in the liver there, okay? Maybe a little contusion in the kidney right there, it's not enhancing very well. And then this sort of fluffy organ right here is the pancreas, and there's a laceration right through the pancreas. And here is blood in the belly, all right? So this CT image gives us a tremendous amount of information whether or not this surgeon needs to go in immediately, needs to, can wait a little bit, or doesn't need to actually go in at all. All right, and prior to CT, the way that we were able to diagnose this, were, there was two ways. One, you had to open up the patient in surgery. Well, okay, that's fine. It's great if the kid really needs surgery, but if you don't need surgery, then you've done an unnecessary, very invasive procedure. Or two, you dump a bunch of water into the belly and then let it drain out, and if there's enough blood in the water, then you go in and operate. Okay, kind of a cute idea, but it's very primitive. 
now I can get an answer about a trauma in literally we can get this CT in two seconds. It's not invasive. Major, major revolution, revolutionization of, of medical medical care. This is a patient who has a really a pretty devastating injury. This is the cervical spine right here, and you can see that's now on so that fracture right there. So the cervical cord's right in there, and it's going to be kinked. It's probably not going to be a great outcome for this patient. Um, but really important to get that information. This is a little one who has, a, this is a head CT, and this is, we're showing the bones right here, the skull, and then this is the brain right here, and you can see that arrow is pointing to the skull fracture. And then this bright stuff right here is some blood on the, uh, just sort of layering over the brain, okay? Uh, critical information, right? We have this, we get a kid who comes in who's got intracranial bleeding, they're, they're going off to primary children's or ERMAC, okay? Um, or it's bad enough, you know, they need to get a uh, neurosurgeon to come in uh, very, very quickly. So they got to go some, you know, somewhere else. Um, and then this one I kind of like, this is a, these are twins, unborn twins. So this is a pregnant mom, okay? And there's something special about these twins, they're conjoined, all right? And actually one of the very first MRIs I read is a fellow who's actually an MRI of conjoined twins. And um, these, these are the twins after they got unconjoined, uh, at Duke, and I, I, I can show this picture because this was in the news and the mom was okay eventually after they got separated for releasing the, 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 the information to the media. But we play, we did um, uh, many, many, many imaging studies on these little ones uh, before and after they were born. Uh, they were sharing some of the liver and they were sharing some of their bowel, and so we had to tease out all of that info, anatomic in information for the surgeons so that they could go in there and uh, appropriately uh, do whatever they needed to do to separate the kids. We even built a 3D model of their liver using imaging, both CT and MRI. And this mom deserves a Nobel Prize because she, she had not only twins, but conjoined twins for like 10 months before they got separated. And I can't imagine how much stress she had to go through with, with that. And she, was, she was awesome. She was really cool. I'm you know, glad they're doing great. Um, so anyways, this is a CT scanner, and that's kind of the primary... Uh, focus of what I'm going to talk about is, is CT scanning. X-ray, kids getting x-rays, the, the dose is so so low that we it's not worth talking about. That's not going to cause any problems. All right. Um, so basically how CT works is the patient lies on this table right here and uh, the, the table goes through this donut hole and in the donut is, a C, is an x-ray machine and it just rotates around very very rapidly and takes 360 degree x-ray images of a patient. And the schematic is kind of like this. It's sort of that, that spring coil here is sort of the, the path of the x-ray uh, machine as the patient goes through the, uh, uh, the, the, the scanner. And then the computer does all of its fancy stuff and pops out an image. So CT stands for computed tomography. Computer and the tomography is using a moving camera to take a picture. All right. This is the very first clinical CT examination ever performed um, in 1971 in London, or in England, I should say, and it was for a woman who they suspected had a, a brain tumor. And actually, you can see it, it's very subtle here, but this dark thing right here in the frontal, one of the frontal lobes, the right frontal lobe, there is the tumor, all right. Pre this took five minutes to obtain, and I bet the radiation exposure was enormous, actually. Now, we can do so many cool things with CT. So this is a CT scan of the chest sort of looking straight on. And what we're able to do is cut away the, the ribs. You can see the ribs here cut away. We can cut out the lungs. And this is all, these are all the vessels in the lungs. All right, we can cut out part of the heart too. And look at them and interpret them, beautiful image. This took a second or two to, to obtain, non-invasively. So to use an example, before CT scans, um, if we needed to do imaging, neurologic imaging of a patient, we had basically two options, aside from actually operating. One would be to stick a needle in the carotid artery and shoot contrast through the carotid artery, take images of the blood vessels, and see if the blood vessels were displaced by a tumor or if they were abnormal due to some other disease. Okay, that's very invasive. It's kind of dangerous to stick a needle in the carotid artery. That's a big deal. The other option was to drain all of the fluid out around the brain and the spinal cord with a lumbar puncture, fill that with air, and then take a bunch of x-ray images. That took a long time. It was incredibly painful. That's also dangerous. Nowadays, we can do a CT scan in 
of the head in literally a second or two and get the information we need. It's non-invasive, it's quick, it's so much more beneficial than what we had before. So really revolutionizing things, um, revolutionizing medical care. Why do we care about x-rays? Well, we're bathed in radiation on a daily basis just from being on this planet. Uh, and some radiation does nothing to us. For instance, radio waves are a form of radiation. But they don't, they're not energetic enough to cause any damage, cellular damage to us. Whereas x-rays and gamma rays are energetic enough that they can cause damage to DNA. The thought is obviously you damage DNA, that can result in mutations that then can result downstream eventually in uh, cancer. Our bodies are very, very good at repairing DNA damage. All right. Well, how do we get from saying that a CT scan can cause cancer? How did we get to this point? Well, mainly, like I said, we can't do good prospective research on this. We can't take a bunch of healthy volunteers and expose them to radiation and just see what happens. That's not ethical. So all that we can really do are follow people who've been exposed to radiation, which is fine, and most of the data that we have about all of the risks of radiation come from people who were purposely but unwillingly exposed to radiation. And those are the people, the survivors of the Japanese uh, atomic bomb uh, blasts okay, that we, you know, we, we bombed Japan in Hiroshima and Nagasaki in the 40s. Uh, and a lot of the data we have now for radiation risk is based on their data. All right. And that's fine. It's very, very difficult, though, to uh, compare a population of Japanese people in the 40s to a population of modern Americans in the 2010s. Vastly different societies, medical treatments, nutritional abnormalities. Japan was losing the war. They were deficient in many things. So it's it, it, like right here, it's already really fraught with, boy, we're, 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 we're extrapolating stuff that it, very, very kind of apples and oranges. Most of the survivors who uh, were exposed to radiation received a dose of radiation over 100 millisieverts, all right? And a sievert is a unit of radiation exposure. Above 100 millisieverts, there's really no question that your risk of cancer due to that radiation exposure is increased. It might not be increased by much, but it does go up. There's really no question. There's no debate in the literature. However, what we, what researchers and physicians want to do is say, well, what about people who get exposed to less than 100 millisieverts? Because an average CT scan, you know, the belly, it's maybe four, five millisieverts. For some, for, for a lot of CT scans we can do for our kids, it's under one millisievert. So that's vastly different than getting 100 millisieverts. Is it the same? All right. Um, and the data is sort of all over the place on that. There's actually some, there's actually data out there that shows that if you get a little bit of radiation, your risk of cancer actually goes down, all right? And I know that sounds crazy, but actually there, there's, there's very convincing data out there that shows that. Um, and that the thought is, well, it encourages your DNA repair mechanisms to kind of rev up. It's sort of like exercising them, all right? All right, that's one theory. Uh, and no one's advocating, you know, giving kids radiation to reduce their risk of cancer. The other theory, and the theory that is typically used, and I know it's kind of nerdy to be talking about on a beautiful summer day, but it's, it's this, this straight line theory called the linear no threshold theory. And this is a graph that shows your risk of cancer versus your dose, okay? And the linear threshold theory, no threshold theory, says that basically as you get more dose, your risk of cancer goes up in a linear fashion, okay? Makes sense, it's straight line. We know that over 100 millisieverts, that's absolutely true. But what this theory says is that if you get 0.001 millisievert of excess radiation, then your risk of cancer does go up. All right, so no matter how much extra radiation, you, your risk of cancer is going to go up. Well, that's fine. That's a perfectly good thought. However, the data is very shaky on this. And the reason why I talk about, I'm talking about the, L, the LNT theory so much is because this is what most of the papers that come out in the newspaper, right, they say, oh, CT scans cause cancer, uh, excess radiation causes cancer. Okay, they use this model, which even the 
international and national nuclear and radiation regulatory societies say is actually a flawed model. The linear no threshold model is sort of akin to saying, okay, we know that everybody who loses two pints of blood or more is at greater risk of dying. All right. By the same corollary, if you get a pinprick and you lose a drop of blood, your risk of dying increases. Okay. We know that that's absolutely not true. All right. There's there's no that doesn't make, that doesn't work. All right. And so that's one of the problems with the linear no threshold theory. If it's in, if it's inaccurate, then it's using it's extrapolating all this data incorrectly. And it's fine if you have little errors for a small population, but if you have a tiny error, you know, in your calculations, and then you extrapolate that to a billion people, your error is magnified by quite a lot. All right. Uh, from a medical standpoint, when we when we do a CT scan, we can actually calculate the dose that the patient gets. Um, and so what happens is they this sort of a, a screen like this pops up, um, and we usually actually report this is a this is called the DLP dose length product. I won't get into what this means, um, uh, but that's kind of a proxy of the dose. And this patient was an adult. I know that, and they had a CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis. So what I can do if I want to calculate their sievert dose. I can take the dose length product and then go to a chart that has a conversion factor for abdomen and pelvis, adult. Here's the conversion factor. Take 235, multiply it by the conversion factor, and then I have what's basically what's called an effective dose. And that's like as if the dose were kind of spread out over the, were reduced but spread out over the whole body. All right. Um, what does this mean? This is a great way for saying, Okay, we're, we're scanning people with the appropriate amount of radiation. We're not using too much, we're not using too little. Uh, this is an appropriate scan dose for this patient. What it's not great for, and I'm not gonna read all of this stuff, is using um, the Sievert data for extrapolating risk of cancer for populations. Uh, International Commission on Radiological Protection, one of the governing kind of world boards for radi radiation protection and safety, it's very clear that those effective doses are not recommended for epidemiological evaluations for big global studies of cancer risk. It's not an appropriate metric for that. All right. And again, I harp on this because um, all of the studies out there that say there is an increased risk of cancer use exactly that data that they're really not supposed to be necessarily using for a big population. All right. So we have to be really careful with how we do the data. And, and nobody's saying that there isn't an increased risk. What we are saying is we need to just be really careful about how, how we use that data and, and what we tell people because it causes some, some real significant problems. Well, you could say, well, that's all fine and good. You can kind of armchair this, but I would never expose myself or my kids to excess radiation if I didn't have to. Fair enough. And my first question to you would be, well, why do you live in Jackson? Cosmic ray, cosmic ray dose, okay, so radiation from cosmic rays. As you might expect, as you get higher and higher in elevation, your radiation exposure goes up. So we are at about 6,200 feet. So every year we get an extra 0.4 millisieverts compared to someone who's living at sea level. So if you have a 10-year-old kid who's lived here for 10 years, they've had four millisieverts of excess radiation, which is about an adult dose for a CT. You've already had that, okay? The reason why I show you this is you put it in context. You don't think about excess, e e excess radiation dose living in Jackson. You love living, you know, you enjoy living here. It's a great place to live. Our kids don't seem to have excess rate of cancer. They don't. We don't seem to have excess rate of cancer. We don't, but here, here we are. So there's a risk, to, risk benefit to everything you choose here. Um, and so this is a, also just a map of North America and the excess radiation you get by elevation. All right, so the red is obviously red and pink are higher. Well, geez, look, you know, look at where we are right here, okay? We're right in the thick of it. One of the other major sources of radiation that we receive every day that we don't think about is radon. So this is sort of a, a pie chart of how, you know, somebody in a year, what their breakdown of radiation exposure is. Yes, medical imaging is quite a lot, but radon is sort of the aqua color here is also quite a lot. Radon is a uranium breakdown product, and if you live or work in a concrete or a cement building, 
um, or any building that has material that has been exposed to uranium, you're going to get exposed to, to radon. These are the uranium recovery sites in the western United States. Look at where we go. <laughs> look, at, look at the number here just in Wyoming. All right. So we do have, we, uh, we do get excess uranium exposure here, again, living in, in Teton County and, and Wyoming. Uh, okay, fine. We don't really think about that. Uh, as a matter of fact, here's CDC 2013 cancer rates by state. All right, Wyoming is in the lowest cohort. cohort. We're not getting any excess radiation. Well, right then and there, you could say, well, wait, that doesn't jive with the linear no threshold theory as well, right? We should be having more cancer rate, okay? But it doesn't, doesn't seem to work. I'm not saying that it's wrong. I'm just saying we are exposed to radiation in a lot of different ways that we don't even think about and, cons and consider. And uh, it's important to have that in context when you or your, or your child comes in and has a, a, an exam, a scan, that exposes you to some radiation. All right, and then this is the problem. So the paper comes out and says, oh, you know, the risk of getting a CT, of having, a, of having your cancer go up by a CT scan is real. This will, um, you know, you need to think about your kids having CT scans and whatnot. Uh, the problem is these studies never talk about the benefits of having a CT scan. And they rarely talk about, well, what is the actual risk increase? And, all of the data, again, shows that it's either zero or such a small amount that compared to living in Jackson for 10 years, maybe you need to put that into context. All right. Um, and this is terrible. This is New York Times right here. You got a doctor who looks like you know, Dr. Evil who's about to radiate you and kill you. Okay? That sticks, these, this imagery sticks with people. It's to the point that they say, you know, I don't actually want my child to have a CT scan or whatnot, when actually, that's actually by absolutely the thing that they should have. All right. Um, and so these things do more harm than good. Uh, so what can we do in medical imaging as professionals about radiation dose? Um, well, actually, pediatric radiologists were very much at the forefront of reducing dose to both kids and adults in CT scans. 20, 30 years ago, it was sort of one size fits all. Kid comes in, gets a CT scan, an adult comes in, gets a CT scan, they basically get the same radiation dose. Well, as a physician, when I order a CT scan or when I, when I recommend a CT scan, it's like I'm prescribing a dose of radiation to a patient, and that radiation is like a dose of medicine. I would never give a baby the same amount of Tylenol that I would give an adult, all right? And pediatric radiologists and now adult radiologists have all worked very hard in the past 10 years to say, you know what, what we need to be doing is just giving the appropriate amount of dose. Not too much, but also not too little, because a, a CT scan that's too low of a dose is actually a high dose scan, because then you've got to do another scan. All right, so anyways, um, these are kids' age ranges 0 to 16, and 2001-2006, uh, the, the MA is, the, is two current that we use so for, for x-rays. So x-rays are all are electronic products, and everything electronic uses current and voltage, and so those are some parameters for dose. You decrease the two current, you decrease the dose. Well, we've had some pretty significant dose decreases between 2001 and 2006, and I'll tell you those doses have gotten lower in the intervening 10 years, too. All right. Uh, one of the major um, pushes to decrease dose is this, is this um, uh, program that's run by the Society of Pediatric Radiology, and it's called Image Shetland. And what it, what it basically is getting radiologists uh, and radiation technologists to do is to say, does this child need a CT scan? Is there something else that they could get, like an ultrasound or an MRI? And if they do need a CT scan, are they getting an appropriate dose? Like I said, a 10 kilogram baby doesn't need a CT scan with as much dose as a 400 pound person. Uh, in, the, in the vein of not one size fits all, right? This little girl is not gonna be helped by that life preserver, okay? Uh, this um, program was, uh, was, was founded and championed by my mentor at Duke, uh, this, uh, pediatric radiologist, uh, Don Frush, who really has made his career on Pediatric dose reduction. He's kind of an international expert in this. Uh, he's just been a great, a great mentor to work with. And so, for instance, here are two CT scans. This is of an infant, 
and then this is of a not infant. And this, this infant here has a, has a bad pneumonia in the lung right here. It's pushing the heart away. All right, and this is a tiny little baby. The dose that we need to get for this kid is way less than the dose for this person. And this person, uh, what, what Don used to say, I really liked it, it was it, elevated body mass index not due to musculature, okay? <laughs> Which is a polite way of saying an overweight person. This is all fat right here, okay? So this is a big person. And you can imagine to get through all that tissue, you gotta, you gotta jack up the dose. But you don't need to do that for this kid. Um, and so what are some things that we can do from a technical perspective to reduce this CT dose? Well, as I said, the, the MA, the tube current, we can reduce the tube current. And this is a head CT that was done 170 MA. And then this was done almost half the dose. And it's a little grainier, you know, but it's still perfectly good. So yeah, we, we reduce the dose. As a matter of fact, when a kid comes in who needs a CT scan, we measure how much they weigh, and then we have weight-based protocols for whatever body part they're getting scanned, and on our scanner, then they get that, that scan. And it's much less dose than we would use for an adult. That is a real benefit to having modern scanning. Our technology has just made leaps and bounds in terms of being able to extract more and more information from less and less data. So this is a person who got one scan, and this is an adult. Uh, and the scan was then, the so we applied software to the scan to try to clean up the images. This FBP is an old type of software to clean up the image. It's called filtered back projection. You can see this is a very grainy image. It would not be diagnostic quality. This would not be an appropriate image to, to use to, to diagnose anything. Well, this is, again, same scan. We haven't changed anything. The patient only got one scan. But we ran it through different, more advanced software. And now, look how clear the image is. All right, so much clearer that we can actually see the, the little lesion in the liver. All right, the little bit of, it's a liver metastasis. Same scan, this patient, an adult was actually scanned with 0.6 millisieverts, which even 10 years ago was unheard of. And again, I'm talking about that is such an astronomically low dose. Um, kids, same way. Our technology has made it so that we can image kids with less radiation and, and extract more information from it. So this is a child who had, a, have, had to have a cardiac scan. CT scan, and scanning the heart is actually very technically difficult. You all have taken pictures, and you've obviously all taken pictures while you inadvertently move the camera or somebody moved, it's blurry, right? So you have no good information in that picture. It's really hard to take a picture of something that's blurry. As a matter of fact, the only way that you can do that is basically make a film of it, right, where you're taking continual pictures. Really hard with the heart, and as a result, CT scans of the heart are usually very high dose because you, it's like you have to take a film of the heart, a long cine clip of the heart, rather than just taking one or two pictures because it's moving. Well now, our scanners are so fast that we can, the, the, the x-ray the x-ray machine can move around the heart so quickly that it can do it in one rotation, get it so quickly that the heart is still still, essentially, all right? And that results in enormous dose savings to both kids and adults in terms of uh, a cardiac scan or really any scan, basically. And so this is a scan where this, kid, this kid's heart was able to be scanned without the scanner moving, it was able to rotate around, just get basically a snapshot image so quickly. Um, and this is pretty amazing. This kid's heart rate was 171 beats per minute. Um, and when we do a cardiac scan at St. John's, we freak out when a patient's heart is over 65 beats per minute because it's really hard to get. So we're able to get a still, beautiful image of the heart here with an extremely low dose in something that's in a kid that's having a very high heart rate, okay? The technology is, is just exploding our ability to, um, uh, uh, to reduce dose. This is our scanner at the hospital. This isn't actually the exact scanner, but we have a, a Quillian one from Toshiba and uh, we had the, the trauma certification team from Wyoming come through the hospital recently, and I was talking with them, and they said, uh, you, you guys have the most advanced scanner in Wyoming. We, we do, we actually have uh, an incredibly advanced CT scanner. Um, and this is some pediatric images created by an Aquilian One scanner, the same scanner we have. And this is a scan, a whole body scan of a little baby. And 
you can see its arms up here, legs down here. Okay, so we're able to get from kind of head to toe, basically. Um, and this is all the same scan, but we just reformatted in a way that you can see different things better. So you can see the kid's skeleton, that's their spine right there, liver right there, kidneys, okay, little hip bone right there, and acute. Um, this kid, this, this image is looking at the lungs well. So this kid has a bunch of cystic lesions in the lungs. They were probably a premature baby, and babies, premature babies can get a cystic lung disease like that. Um, this is just another way of looking at it so that we can see the soft tissues. There's the heart. This kid has a, uh, has a fluid collection under the liver. That could be a congenital thing or an abscess or a, some collection of bile or whatnot. So the information that we can get from this one scan is enormous, and it can be incredibly helpful to the, to the uh, regular doctors and the surgeons about what we need to do for this kid. This scan was done, was acquired in half a second. So we went from a five minute head CT scan to a whole body half a second scan. 15 MA, 15 tube current, and a dose of 0.4 millisieverts. All right, so again, that's a tenth of what is a normal abdomen pelvis CT for an adult. And I will tell you, that as our technology gets better and better, our adult doses are gonna continue to drop as well. This is, this is so little, I mean, we're starting to, I think in the future, we're starting to get to the point where our CT scans are gonna approach a dose for a single or several x-rays, that low. Benefits of this scan, we got enormous uh, anatomic benefit from this, um, and this kid, for instance, didn't need to be sedated as they would have been for an MRI. Sedation has its own issues, actually. So, and, and this game took half a second. All right, so an enormous amount of information with an extremely low radiation dose. Uh, the benefits just totally outweigh the risks in this case. Um, and then the last thing is one of the most common things we see in the pediatric or the young population is kids come in, young adults come in, belly pain, we're worried about appendicitis. Well, what do we do in that case? Yeah, I mean, it's easy to say, all right, we should do a CT for somebody who's in trauma who might die in 10 minutes because we need to know information. But appendicitis isn't actually really an emergency. It's something that has to be dealt with, to be sure, but it's not something that has to, you don't hit the door of the ER and have to go straight to surgery. Well, what do we do as pediatric radiologists and radiologists are committed to reducing dose? Well, if the patient's a young kid, first thing we try is an ultrasound. We look to see if we can see the appendix on an ultrasound. If it looks normal or clearly the kid has appendicitis, great, we're done. We haven't had to do a CT scan at all. Um, but a lot of times we don't see the appendix on ultrasound. That's just a limitation of that study. So then we go to a CT and we do a CT and the CT can give us enormous information. Before, this, before the era of CTs, surgeons were happy to have a 10% negative appendectomy rate. That means that one out of 10 patients they brought to the OR to take their appendix out, they were completely wrong, and it wasn't the appendix that was the problem. Why were they happy about that? Because you don't want to miss appendicitis. It can, the appendix can rupture and cause a big abscess in the belly, and then you've got some real serious problems. So surgeons were happy to kind of over-operate for appendicitis. Well, now in the era of CT scanning, they don't, they don't want to do that at all. They never want to open up a belly. That putting a patient under, putting them through a surgery that they don't need has, some, has significant drawbacks as well. And we can tell so much from the CT about what's going on with the appendix. We can say, hey, yeah, you know what? Um, the, the kid has appendicitis, but it's, it's perforated, and there's actually a big abscess. And then surgeons won't go in and operate. They want to just, they'll just drain that abscess before they do anything. Or we'll say, you know what? This isn't appendicitis at all. It's a tumor or it's an infected other part of bowel, in which case the surgeons might say, whoa, we need to totally change our plan or we don't need to operate at all. We need to do, you know, give this patient medicine or something like that. So we can get enormous information from a CT scan uh, in this case, and that's a real common case. So uh, just to close up, uh, CT, the risk of CT is potentially either zero or very, very small if you get one or two, three CTs in your life, particularly if you're young, all right? People who are getting 50, 60 CTs in their lifetime, generally, unfortunately, they die from whatever is causing them to get that much imaging, all right? And when you're over a certain age, 50, 60, frankly, we just don't really, I mean, we, we never want to overdose a patient with radiation, but we don't, 
we don't worry that much about the cancer effects of that because it just takes too long to, to really manifest cancer in, in, in a population that's, that's you know in the 60s, 70s. But if you're one, then you've got a whole lifetime to live with that radiation dose. So absolutely, we're really concerned about that dose. But anyway, CT's not going to go away. CT will continue to be used, but used judiciously. Actually, the rates of CT utilization for kids peaked uh, probably about maybe 10 years ago, and they've come down a little bit. So a lot of the data that came out and all the kind of the hoopla about uh, the, the cancer risk did cause utilization rates to go down. And as a pediatric imager, I think that's great. We should not do a CT if we can do an ultrasound. We should not do a CT if we can do an MRI. But that's not to say that an ultrasound or an MRI is always the best test. Sometimes CT is absolutely the best test and there's no question. Sometimes we have to do all three. Um, the other benefit is the technology advances, we're going to be able to do lower and lower dose CTs and get more and more information from that. So again, like as I said, you know, if we did a study where we watched people for 30 years who got, you know, see if they had cancer, by the end of 30 years the technology is different. Well, it is different. Ten years ago we were using different technology than we are now. So um, we're using less dose, getting more information. Um, so I just want you to, you know, if you do go in the hospital, if you do have, yourself have to have a scan, you have a child who has to have a scan, by and large, it's, it's the, the question that it's answering is far more important than whatever tiny risk it is for increased risk of cancer. And I hope that this talk kind of puts things in the context of like, well, yeah, you've chosen to live in Jackson. You've chosen to give yourself voluntarily extra radiation, but you don't think about that risk. You think about the benefits because... For you, the benefits outweigh the risks, and that's very much the case for CT as well.